Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series has been a great series on the three angels' messages. But looking at the whole larger picture, we call it the three cosmic messages. And this is lesson number 13 in that series for June 24 of 2023, entitled A Blaze. A blaze with God's glory. That sounds like an exciting time. Shall we begin with the word of prayer? Our Father, we can't even imagine, we're not capable of imagining what that's going to be like, to be in your presence, rejoicing and celebrating and drinking from the tree of, uh, eating from the tree of life and drinking from the river of life. What, a, what an experience to gather with all of the saints, thousands, maybe millions of them, down through history and be able to talk to them and find out everything they've happened, that's happened to them. It's, it's hard to imagine how long it would take just to meet everybody. We look forward to it, and may it be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, have you noticed that our world seems to be in a lot of chaos? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. There's so many factions in our country as well as in other countries. And there, I mean, look at the devastating storms and so forth that are happening. Different countries of the world are in opposition to each other. What will bring all these different factions to some common conclusions? The Bible talks about two basic groups, as you know. One group is faithfully keeping the seven-day Sabbath in honor of the Creator and all that He stands for, the whole package there. All, including all that he has done for us in the plan of salvation. And the other is a Sunday-keeping group who will be worshiping the beast. And if we can believe the book of Revelation, they are going to be worshiping the dragon himself, who turns out to be Satan himself. Well, will, will faithful Sabbath keepers be arrested, even killed? How widespread will this be in the world? What will communistic countries and Muslim countries say or do about this edict? Will they have their own version of anti-Christian laws or edicts? I mean, it's hard to imagine that a, you know, rabid Muslim country or a completely uh, Hindu country or a communist country, are they going to demand that everybody worship on Sunday? They want the, there was a piece in the paper recently, they want the them to get rid of Jesus, period. Oh, I'm sure that's probably too in some places. Yeah. Well, will they have their own version of anti-Christian laws or edicts? Revelation 13 and 14 clearly suggests that the whole world will be divided into these two camps. If it becomes illegal to worship on the seventh-day Sabbath, will Muslim countries use this as an excuse to attack Israel? What do you think? From a practical standpoint, there are many Jews who currently worship on Sunday. Mm. Wow. They say, we, we know that the rest of the world is worshiping on Sunday. You know, it's just impractical to worship on Saturday. Yeah, right. <clears throat> Could the Seventh-day Adventist Church as an organization continue to exist officially when it becomes illegal to worship on the Sabbath? All you prophets, tell me. I think it, it depends on the country, the, the countries involved. Uh -huh. What I've been well, reading of late, it's uh, you're okay in certain areas and not so good in others. Did you use the word organized? Yes, the organization. Oh. Well, in light of what we read in Revelation 12 through 14, we believe that God has raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church to preach this final end-time message to the world. Do we understand this message clearly? Do we know what it means to honor God and give Him glory? And of course, you recognize that's from the first angel's message. So, Jim, can you read, us to, read to us about that? The focus of our study has been, and this week will be, on God's glory revealed to his people to lighten his sin-darkened world, changed by grace, transformed by love, filled with the Holy Spirit, 
God's last message, excuse me, last day church gives his final appeal to this world and tens of thousands hear and respond to the call. Thus, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come, Matthew 24, 14. Yeah, you recognize that? Guide. And that's quoted in the Bible study guide. So, Carrie, you want to take on that next one there? Yes. The great controversy between good and evil in the universe is about God's honor and reputation. Satan, a rebel angel, was declared that God is unjust, that he demands worship but gives little in return. The evil one declares that God's law is arbitrary and restricts our freedom and limits our joy. I mean, you can't go to the ball game on Sabbath afternoon. Isn't that a restriction of your freedom? <laughs> Some people, yeah. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection exploded that myth. The one who created us plunged into this snake pit of a world to redeem us. Wow. On the cross, Jesus answered Satan's charges and demonstrated that God is both loving and just. Charmed by his love, concerned about his honor, his end time people reveal his glory, his loving, self-sacrificing character to a self-centered, godless world. Thus, the earth will be illuminated by a revelation of the character of God. And that came from Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide 172. Yeah. Paul warned the people of Thessalonica many, many years ago in these words. It almost sounded like he was talking to us. Jennifer? First Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 6. There is no need to write to you, brothers and sisters, about the times and occasions when these things will happen. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come as a thief comes at night. When people say, everything is quiet and safe, then suddenly destruction will hit them. It will come as suddenly as the pains that come upon a woman in labor, and people will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the darkness, and the day should not take you by surprise like a thief. All of you are people who belong to the light, who belong to the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, we should not be sleeping like the others. We should be awake and sober. Okay, that's from our Good News translation. Are we really children of the light? Are we studying the warning signs of the second coming? And, you know, <clears throat> this is a bit of a challenge because traditionally we Adventists have talked about precise datings. We've talked about the 1260-day prophecy. We've talked about the 2300-day prophecy and other things like this. And we know, okay, this happened right here and ends right here. But what do we say about prophecies that say, well, when you see this and this and this and this happening, beware. Isn't that a pretty valid prophecy? Is a warning sign of the second coming the right term? Or is it a, yippee, he's coming? <laughs> well, that, that's what it should be. Yeah, for, it will be for a lot of people. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Isaiah 25, I think it is. Yeah. <clears throat> but nevertheless, what kind of, is it just going to be, I mean, th this, this verse that Jennifer just read for us says that we're not supposed to be in the dark. So I'm trying to say, what, is, what light do we have? Where, wh how do we know if we're going to be in the light? Probably just studying scripture <laughs> to practice scripture so i think the certainly scripture is a clue should be a clue right yeah. well will seventh day adventists need another prophet to warn us of what is coming or have we had all the warnings we need jesus himself warned us repeatedly to watch and keep awake i think that's our biggest challenge yeah you want to read those passages there Matthew 24, 42, be on your guard then, because you do not know what day your Lord will come. In Matthew 26, 40 to 41, then he returned to the three disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, how is it that you three were not able to keep watch with me even for one hour? 
keep watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We have fabulous Bible translations, I mean, not just Bible translations, fa fabulous programs that translate from one language to another in our days. Many, many years ago when I was young, they were just experimenting with programs like that at the United Nations. Mm. And they had one, but the big issue in those days was English to Russian, back and forth. Can we find a reliable program that will translate from Russian to English and English to Russian? And so someone came up with a program and said, oh, this will do it. And so someone, I don't know, was, was a smart aleck or whatever, he gave him that, that spirit, that, I mean that quotation there, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And it came back, the wine is okay, but the meat's gone bad. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, their, their, their program was a little lacking. It is likely that the three disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane were just, or is it likely that the three disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane were just physically tired and sleepy? Or was Satan using his skills in making them sleepy? Now you, you, you get the idea where I'm going, don't you? Did is, Satan use inhalation narcotics? <laughs> <laughs> is Satan capable of lulling us to sleep when we should be awake to the signs developing around us? From the writings of Ellen G. White, we who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. Okay, so how would an overwhelming surprise break upon our world? Doesn't it, it doesn't seem like anything is, you know, overwhelming surprise to the whole world. There's somebody who knows already and is hiding the information or something. But there's what it says. Seventh-day Adventists and our Adventist predecessors have preached the message of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 for more than 170 years. <clears throat> we believe that history has been foretold in these messages. The, true, the truth culminates with the second coming of Jesus Christ, represented by that rock carved out of the mountain, which completely fills the earth and eliminates and destroys all human governments and nations. And of course, that's represented by that statue that King Nebuchadnezzar saw. God has used dreams to great advantage in the past. Could he ever use them again in the future? Or have we reached a place where we no longer consider dreams of any real significance? Okay, all you prognosticators. I, th I think the, uh, he uses stuff like up in the Philippines and some of those back block things you, you read about people getting dreams mm -hmm. and they, they walk through the jungle and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. It's being done, we just don't see it much here. Yeah, that's true. Well, uh, is that part of, uh, is that true in all parts of the world? That's what your question was. The Seventh-day Adventist Church would not exist, let's be honest, if it were not for the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation and the additional insights we have been given by Ellen White. And so we've looked at this before, but I think it's a momentous quotation. When the books of Daniel, this is from Ellen White, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, now, what was it that they didn't understand that needs to be better understood? Believers will have an entirely different religious experience. Is she talking about the great controversy? Mm -hmm. I think so. Was Uriah Smith uh, about the same time as Helen White? Who? Uriah Smith. Uriah Smith. Uriah Smith was older. He was older, right? Because yeah. he wrote that book, Daniel and Revelation, yeah. that we studied. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's been questioned by some uh, prominent folk. Yeah because some of the main countries that he talked about as being movers, they've sort of faded. That's the, only, that's the main issue there. Okay, they will be given, this should, could be us, will be given such glimpses of the open gates of heaven, whatever that means, that heart and mind will be impressed in regard to the character all must develop in order to realize the blessedness which is to be the reward of the pure in heart. 
The Lord will bless all who will seek humbly and meekly to understand that which is revealed in the Revelation. This book contains so much that is large with immortality and full of glory that all we read and search it, er, that all who read and search it earnestly receive the blessing to those, quote, that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written thereon, therein. One thing we will, will certainly be understood, now here's one clear thing from the study of Revelation, that the connection between God and his people is close and decided. Hmm. Does that have something to do with um, the Great Controversy? Sounds like it, doesn't it? And Carrie, you know where you came from. Hmm. Notice that this was written from Sunnyside, Kurumbang, New South Wales, down in Australia. Written to the Review and Herald editor. Been there many times. Back in 1900, yes. It's a beautiful place. I managed to get there once. If we are supposed to be awake, and if we are supposed to know the truth, where can we find it? Jim? John 17, excuse me, John 7, verse 17. Whoever is willing to do the, do what God wants will know whether that, excuse me, whether what I teach comes from God or whether I speak on my own authority from the Good News Bible. And then John 8, 32, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Also from the okay. Good News Bible. Are we fully aware of the errors in doctrines and teachings found in the apostate churches? Do we know how to respond to those errors by carefully studying the Bible? The second angel, which we will focus on in this study, clearly encourages us to search the scriptures for ourselves. And why do we need to search the scriptures for ourselves to respond to the second angel's message? He says, come out of her, my people, right? Yes. And if you don't know why you're coming out, or why you should come out, or what you have to do to come out, you're in trouble, right? Seventh-day Adventists have often referred to ourselves as those people who have accepted the Third Angel's message. I can remember back when I was a child, when someone joined the Adventist church, the, the idea was, oh, You've joined the third angel's message. That was that was the term that was used. Okay, Carrie. The third angel's message, which follows the first two angels, presents a warning against the mark of the beast. Throughout the prophecies of the Bible, the beast represents a political or religious power. The sea beast of Revelation 13 and 14 arises out of Rome as a worldwide system of worship. Eventually, this Roman power extends its influence over the whole world and will lead out in a moment to unite church and state, in a movement rather. The goal will be to achieve world unity at a time of economic upheaval, natural catastrophes, social turmoil, international political crisis, and global, global conflict from adult school study guide. Are we, are we talking about it now? Yeah. Well, <laughs> what's not included in that? List? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I will just tell you that I saw a lecture. I heard a lecture, sir, heard it and saw it. I saw the person pre pre presenting it. They did some re research and found this was just the 20th century. We haven't even, not even talking about our century. 20th century, the number of major natural disasters in the last decade of that century was 10 times as great as in the first decade. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you? And I can... I think I'm, it tells us that we have better communication and we know about them. That, but th well, this is not talking about a little here and a little there. We're talking about things that qualify as major natural disasters. I, I don't, I think, I mean, there th back in those days, they used to have er earthquakes that killed thousands of people in Turkey. But those things would get on into the U.S. newspapers. Well, I mean, I'm sure there's a little bit of that. But ten times? I don't think so. Anyway. The goal will be to achieve world unity. Okay, that was the question I asked you earlier. How are we going to do that? Out of total chaos comes total control. Yeah. 
and it's coming. Is there any worldwide organization that is quietly working on plans to unite churches and governments around the world to support their cause? Yeah. Some of you have seen some of the lectures that have been recorded when Roman Catholic dignitaries have a high level, have been asked to come and give presentations to Protestant groups. Yeah. What does that mean? That has happened at Andrews. Okay, well, let's not get too close here. We'll be in trouble. The, word, <laughs> the wording in Revelation 13 is scary. Could it really be true that essentially the entire world will be worshiping the devil? Will they know they're worshiping the devil? Can you worship something without knowing it? It could go both ways. You get drunk and forget what's going on. Be in the military service or something like that. Get mm -hmm. killed. There's all kinds of ways. The, this power that we're ta they're talking about operates on the basis of force, right? Yeah. Which is the opposite, the antithesis of the way God operates. Yes. With freedom and love. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> if you... If you like to, that, that way of controlling others, you have a desire to control others, uh, encratia, mm -hmm. uh, which is it's the opposite of encratia, is yeah. what, what they're, what they're uh, Yeah, exactly. Promoting. Yeah, I heard a, a very interesting lecture yesterday from a gentleman, uh, his name is Eric Metaxas, and he says, the United States is a nation that is built on an idea, not on a monarchy, not on some geographical separation. There's some of that, obviously. It's a nation that is built on an idea. And it was a revolutionary idea when it happened. It's still a revolutionary idea, but more and more people are saying, no, we don't, we're not, we're not going to stand up and die for things we believe in. You know, that's, that's too much trouble, you know. We're, we don't believe in those ideas that led us to our nationhood at one time. But there it is, clearly, all the, nearly the entire world is going to be worshiping the devil. Well, the other talk, this other side is talking about unity. Mm -hmm. Well, who's talking about at one minute? Mm -hmm. But they don't talk, they, they like to think in those terms, but they talk, use the term atonement. Mm -hmm. which is a, a, a pagan. If you're, if you're engaged in paganism, how are you going to extract yourself? That's, isn't that Babylon? Well, it depends on what they say next. <laughs> well, I mean, if, you're, if you're embracing paganism yeah. and you think that, that that's the, the way to uh, please the, the deity, yeah. uh, you've, got a, uh, you've got an adulterated perception so of... If, if you have a group of people who are committed to worshiping the devil... Well, they think it's wrong to destroy God's people? Of course. I don't think so. Oh, Could we, they... We got, we got, if you ever watch the news or clip, yeah. news clips or whatever, I mean, you, the perversion is about as bad as I've ever, you know, yeah. what has happened over the last three years. It just... Uh... Some of the Adventists have suggested that apostate Protestantism centered in the United States will impact our government and eventually lead in this global confederation. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the, and under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. From wow. Ellen G. White, The Great Controversy. Wow, wow, wow. Is that really possible? Yeah. It's happening. Um, it's happening, yes. <laughs> it's happening. Uh, did yeah. the... Uh, did, did, I do not know of any one reformer who believed in immortality of the soul. Not one. 
neither did they believe in also in the eternal hell. So who is really a Protestant today? Well, yeah, is it any wonder that God calls for us to be faithful and to endure? John 8, 32, which we read a little earlier, tells us that the truth shall make you free. Does that mean free from the deceptions and misrepresentations of Satan? Does it finally mean to be free from the torture, threats, imprisonment, and death that we know are coming from Satan and his earthly associates at the end of time? Yeah, yeah. And this truth is Jesus Christ himself. Yes. He will, will make you free, and mm -hmm. free indeed. A study of the history of the Reformation teaches us that the Reformers had studied their Bibles very carefully and tried to lead people out of the errors of the apostate church. Martin Luther himself realized that the seventh day was God's true day of worship. However, he decided not to buck the traditions of the dominant church on that point because he was bucking the traffic on so many other points at that point. Revelation 18 verse 1 tells us that the entire world is going to be enlightened with God's glory. After this I saw another angel coming down <clears throat> out of heaven. He had great authority and his splendor brightened the whole earth. He cried out in a loud voice, She has fallen. Great Babylon has fallen. She is now haunted by demons and unclean spirits. All kinds of filthy and hateful birds live in her. For all the nations have drunk her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. The kings of the earth practice sexual immor immorality with her. And the merchants of the world grew rich from her unrestrained lust. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out, my people, come out from her. You must not take part in her sins. You must not share in her punishment. Good News Bible. And I'm reminded in the chapter just before that, you discover that what used to be the faithful, pure, virgin bride of Christ had turned into this woman dressed in purple and other kinds of colors and dressed with all kinds of stuff. And what, who is, what is she riding on? The dragon. Well, the beast, which we know and describes it, is the dragon. It's the devil himself. So here's a so-called Christian church riding on and being, thus being carried away by the devil himself. And the whole world follows. How will this actually take place? What will it mean? How many people will be aware of this when it happens? Is, is the whole world just going to be swept away without even realizing what's going on? I mean, we just said earlier, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached where? To all the world. To all the world. I mean, somebody's out there supposed to be at least listening. And Ellen White says, uh, you might remember this, she says, what we neglected to do in times of peace, we'll have to do it in very difficult circumstances. Yes. Revelation 18 goes on to say that the kings of the earth took part in Babylon's immorality and lust. What does that mean? From the SD Bible commentary in uh, Revelation chapter 18, Babylon is arraigned before the bar of divine justice on five, five counts. Pride and arrogance, materialism and luxury, adultery and deception, and persecution. Okay, now when you talk about a church committing adultery, what does that mean? Syncretism would be one element. Okay, Just so incorporating a bunch of pagan religions so and, and it passing it off as if it's truth. Yeah. Attempting to, anyway. Yeah. Revelation 18.1 reflects a message that was given just before the Babylonian captivity. Habakkuk 2.14, look at this. But the earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the seas are full of water. And when was Habakkuk talking? Just before Jerusalem is finally taken completely contrary to God's plan, taken captive and destroyed, and the people carried off to Babylon. But did this really happen? Did it really happen? Yeah, Habakkuk 2, 14, that the earth will be full of His glory. Well, whenever, whenever the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord's glory. 
Yeah, but he was talking about before the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. But, but he's talking about the final events of this world's history. It was predicted way back there. There's, there hasn't been any time since then that the knowledge of the Lord's glory has been worldwide, not that I know of. Not, neither do I. Well, Revelation 18.1 suggests that an angel will come down from heaven with great authority. How will that manifest itself? Do we have any previous examples of this kind of message? Notice what authority Jesus gave his disciples. Will he give similar authority to his end time people? Jim? Matthew 10, verse 1. Jesus called the 12 disciples together and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and every sickness. Okay, he called them to, he gave them authority. Okay, go ahead. Matthew 10, verses 7 and 8. Skip, skip, <laughs> yeah, 7 and 8. Go, go and preach, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, bring the dead back to life, mm -hmm. heal those who are suffering from dreaded dis skin diseases, and drive out demons. You have received without pain, so give without being paid. Okay, why do you suppose they quoted Matthew 10, verses 1, and they didn't quote Matthew 10, 7 and 8? What's the difference? Bringing back to life. Bringing the dead back to life. Do you think any of the disciples did that? Now this is Jesus sending his disciples out to cover Galilee and later he sent them out a larger group to cover all of Perea on the other side of the Jordan. And he said, bring the dead back to life. If Jesus was standing here and said to us, Okay, I'm sending you out to bring the dead back to life. You would say, sure, Lord, no that problem. Was... <laughs> what? Got your attention. <laughs> yeah. Is that a metaphor for other ways of looking at things? Or? I don't think they heard it as a metaphor. I think they heard it as what it says. Well, they, they did it. They did it later after Jesus was gone. They right. did it. Yes. So, why not at that time? We don't have record that they did it while I, Jesus was on, the, on this earth. John tells us about that, doesn't he? He said if everything that Jesus did had been written, it would fill up the whole world. Wouldn't so, be enough books to yeah. record. And then them. everything that the disciples did, but by the way, none of them were on denominational payroll. And, uh, you notice that too? Yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> but 10 of those 11 died at the hands of others yeah. also. So. Well, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Where are we? Is that um, Gary? Yes. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus drew near and said to them... I now, let me interrupt for a second. This is after his resurrection. Yes. They've gathered in, 500 of them have gathered on a mountainside in Galilee. And again, you know, I said, what would we do if Jesus was right here? Okay, Jesus came down from the sky, or he, I, he may have just suddenly appeared, I don't know. I'm sure he looked like the old Jesus that they knew, but they knew that he had been to heaven, and he said to them, what? Go ahead. Okay. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. Amen. You know, okay. That, that, that's a later rendering. The earliest one of, of that passage, it says, baptize them in my name. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's, that's a made up thing afterwards. Well, we'll have to see about that. But anyway, um, it's clear that Jesus is giving an instructions to who? His disciples. disciples. And how many does that include? Yeah. Is he talking about everybody to the end of this world's history? Peoples everywhere. How many of us in this room does that include? All of us. 
So whose authority will we recognize in our own lives, God's or the devil's? The devil is going to be demanding that the whole world follow him at the same time. Don't we believe that? That's what it says. Revelation 4, 11, 5, 12, 19, 1, and 21, 26, and the time is rushing on, so I'm not going to read those. Associate God's glory with certain other very important words. They suggest that because God has created us, he should be worthy of honor, power, wealth, wisdom, strength, and praise. Those are the words that John uses, or translators have used anyway. As we have suggested on many occasions, the great controversy is a contest between God and Satan about who can run a better universe. Remember, that was Satan's claim way back standing next to the throne of God. Satan has done everything he can to misrepresent God's character and government. But as this world comes to an end, it will be demonstrated what would happen if Satan were allowed to be in charge. And how is that going to be demonstrated? The plagues. Seven last plagues will be Satan's demonstration of what things would be like if he were in charge. And why is that true? Because what's going to happen is Satan is, knows that if God, uh, even a significant number of people stand firmly and faithful to God's side, it's all over for him. This is a life and death matter for him. Now, there's going to be a millennium, and I understand it's not going to be till the third coming, but the, the decision is going to be made if a group stands firm. So what he wants, what he would like to do, is to wipe out all of God's faithful people. And what does God say? No, that's the one thing I will not allow you to do. He is so furious that he throws the seven last plagues at the earth, trying to destroy God's people, which he can't do. Wow. The truth about God and his government was demonstrated convincingly and without any questions remaining by the life and death of Jesus Christ. So what is God's glory? From Exodus 33, 18 through 19. Then Moses requested, Please, let me see the dazzling light of your presence. The Lord answered, I will make all my splendor pass before you, and in your presence I will pronounce my sacred name. I am the Lord, and I show compassion and pity on those I choose. Good News Bible. Okay, so what did Moses see? The Bible suggests that he saw God's backside. Okay, and did he go down the mountain and say, guess what, I saw God's backside? He was, face was he was beaming. glowing. Yeah. He was glowing. He was radioactive. <laughs> so what did God reveal to Moses? You know, it's very interesting because I am starting to, um, as I ride my bike and as I run the hills, I've decided to go through the series of uh, nine volumes of the testimonies. And I'm looking way back at the early times when she was just starting, and she talks about, on several occasions, different people standing up speaking the truth and their faces glowing with a light from God. In her era? In her era. Really? And later on, one time when she was up in the highlands of she and her husband, for the sake of his health and her health too for that matter, were up in the very high territory in, in, in Colorado. And her husband went out to do something, I can't remember exactly, and she was home praying, and when he came back, his face was lit up with, with a light from heaven. His, his face his or face, her face? His face, on his this, face. in this case. Mm -hmm. So, I think it's possible in our day. God's glory is the truth about his character. We ourselves have no glory. We are not ultimately responsible for good works, or righteousness, or goodness. If we do those things, where does it come from? God himself. Jesus himself. Okay. Ellen White, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, says, The Lord God of heaven will not send upon the world his judgments for disobedience and transgression until he has sent his watchmen to give the warning. He will not close up the period of probation until the message shall be more distinctly proclaimed. Of course, this was written 100 years ago. We, we now have it more than 100 years ago. We now have it perfect, right? Yeah, of course. 
And that's having... Why, that's why we're not in heaven? That's why we're not in heaven. The law of God is to be magnified. Its claims must be presented in their true sacred character that the people may be brought to decide for or against the truth. Yet the work will be cut short in righteousness. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel. Okay, so that raises a question that some of you will recognize. Something that was discussed in 1888 after the great general conference session of 1888. And, we, you know, we have general conference sessions that last a couple of weeks and there's meetings in the middle, sort of, and it's, it's a big blow and bang. In those days, it was a six-week affair. There was three weeks of ministerial meetings, and then there's three weeks of meetings. And it was, the, the group in 1888 was about 90 people. So they had a chance to really sit down and talk and think and so forth. They didn't, but that, they had a chance to. <laughs> and she came out after that and said, what is justification? Well, go ahead, Charles, that's yours. Sir, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. When they begin to praise and exalt God all the day long, then by beholding they are becoming changed into the same image. What is regeneration? It is revealing to man what is in his own real nature that in himself he is, not wor he is worthless. Yeah. Ellen White, special testimony to the minister. Okay, so that's, that's our natural condition. But she goes on repeated, I think she says like 700 times or something in all of her writings, that we can partake of the divine nature. This worthless piece of humanity here can partake of the divine nature. Well, what do those words that she wrote, what do they mean? In the book of Revelation, there are many symbols and signs. As we come to the end of our series, let us see if we can nail down what some of these symbols stand for. Revelation 12, three and four and seven, Another mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a huge red dragon, and that's the one that is carrying the woman in Revelation 17, with seven heads and ten horns on a, and a crown on each of his heads. With his tail, he dragged a third of the stars out of the sky and threw them down to the earth. He stood in front of the woman in order to eat her child as soon as it was born. And what do we believe that refers to? Jesus and his birth. Yeah. There, Satan, boy, Satan did everything he could possibly do to de kill Jesus or just make his, you know, eliminate his influence, anything to keep him from accomplishing his work. But then it says, then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels, and you know the results. Clearly, this huge red dragon is none other than Lucifer, now Satan himself, God's open opponent, shaitan in Hebrew, means what? Adversary. Um. One of the interesting symbols that appears repeatedly in Revelation is the lamb. Why is this symbolism so important and repeated so often? And look at all the verses. We don't have time to read. Well, I, maybe we can read one or two of them. Uh, let's pick, look at... Revelation 17, 17. For God has placed in their hearts the will to carry out his purpose by acting together and giving the beasts their power to rule until God's words come. I'm sorry, that's, uh, that's not one of the ones I wanted. Let's try again. Uh, let's look at uh, 21, 22, and 20. I did not see a temple in the city because its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God shines on it and the Lamb is its lamp. And we know, going back, there are lots of other references. 
In these verses, we see a lamb who has been brutally slaughtered, now standing in the midst of the throne of God in the center of heaven, and he is being praised by all around him. That's back in chapter 5. Is this because he has won the great controversy on behalf of all beings in the universe? Why is he being praised? Because he's demonstrated what God is like. The book of Revelation opens by telling us that it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. We are told that Jesus Christ is the Lamb, and he is a Lamb who was brutally slaughtered to demonstrate how Satan would treat anyone who tries to oppose him. Why did Jesus get treated like that? He was openly fighting the devil. So what happens to other people who try that? Well, I don't think we'll be crucified, but Satan would love to do that if he could. Okay, where are we now? Jim, I think. Well, the Bible said to guide, of course, as the opening words of the book say, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ, and not only is he a lamb, but he is also a lamb slain. This is from Revelation chapter 5, verse 6 and 12, Revelation 1, uh, 13. verses, oh, excuse me, 13, uh, 8. That is, Jesus crucified here is the heart and soul not only of all the Bible, but also of the book of Revelation and of the three angels' messages. We cannot be faithful to our calling we cannot do the work that God has raised up the church to do unless we have the lamb, the slain lamb, Jesus crucified as a sacrifice for our sins, as the focal point of our message from the Bible study guide. Okay, so what's the focal point of Christ's life and death when thinking in terms of the great controversy? Well, he tells the truth about his father, right? He tells the truth about his father. And then at the very end, he demonstrates what Satan will try to do to everyone who doesn't get on his side. So there's the great controversy. You know, God facing the devil just like that at the cross. And then our Bible study guide, Carrie. We must intentionally place the lamb that was slain at the very center of our doctrines and mission and at the heart of every sermon we preach, mm, every amen. article we write, every prayer we make, every song we sing, every Bible study we give and in everything we do. Let the love revealed by the Lamb on the cross transform the way we treat each other and move us to also care for the world. Mm. Well, That's from Angel Manuel Rodriguez. And a an unpublished article that he wrote. Yeah. What will be the result of all this as we approach the final days of this world's history? Jennifer? This is from Ellen G. White. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration. Hold on. Their faces what? Lighted up and... There it is. Go ahead. Like Moses. Will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Revelation 13.13 13. Thus, the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. The message will be carried not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The arguments have been presented, the seed has been sown, and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence, yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness, and the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. The Great Controversy. 
a large number. Amen. That's exciting. Yes. Great controversy 612. That's near the end of the book, isn't it? What could actually cause this to happen? What is the relationship between justification by faith and all that we have learned in Revelation 12 through 14? Seventh-day Adventists have been emphasizing the keeping of God's commandments since the first day of our movement, first days of our movement. Of course, this is because we read Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 14, 12. Let's, I think we have time just to read those very quickly. Here it is. Revelation 12, 17 says, The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truths revealed by Jesus. And then if you go to 14.12, it says, This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Okay. Does this mean we are legalists? If we're very strictly trying to obey God's commandments? Don't everybody talk at once here. <laughs> What world events do you see happening today that hint that we are moving closer and closer to the final days of this world's history? Looking again at Paul's statement in 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 6, but you, brothers and sisters, are not in the darkness, and the day should not take you by surprise like a thief. All of you are people who belong to the light, who belong to the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, we should not be sleeping while the others, like the others. We should be awake and sober. Which I means awake and thinking. I, I think that Paul, with the help of his God's Spirit, is speaking to us. The world is asleep and will be taken by complete surprise when events happen that lead to the second coming. We are not supposed to be asleep. We have been more than adequately warned. Jesus has done everything he can to refute Satan's arguments. So, who is telling us the truth? What will it be like when, when the Holy Spirit is poured out in the fullness of this earth? Will only the faithful be aware of it? The Holy Spirit will be poured out in the fullness of his power just before the coming of Jesus. And the earth will be lightened with the glory of God. Revelation 18.1 is fulfillment of the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk's words. For the earth will be full, filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord and the waters as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk 2.14. Yeah. As we just commended, the glory of God is his character of love. But this assertion begs a question, how will this glory be revealed in the last moment of the history on a normally, morally, morally darkened, sin-polluted planet? How is, is, is God actually going to be able to do something to get the whole world's attention at one time? Is that possible? We are told yes. Yes, yes. with God anything. That's not what I asked. I said, is it possible? Yes. I know what we're told. Well, I think it is. We don't know just how, but it will. Uh, reading again, Revelation 18, 1 and Habakkuk 2. After this, I saw another angel coming down out of heaven. He had great authority and his splendor brightened how much of the earth? Oh. The whole earth. Habakkuk 2, 14 says, but the earth will be as full of the knowledge of lo the Lord's glory as the seas are full of water. Now, how full of the seas with water? Completely, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so how are they going to, how is the, the knowledge of the Lord's glory going to fill the earth? I mean, considering what you, what's going on out there in the world now, does that seem possible? Maybe digitally. <laughs> digitally, okay, that, that should be one way to help for sure. Well, to answer this question of how God's glory will be revealed, let us consider an experience of Moses. Remember, when Moses asked God to show him his glory, what did God reveal? 
Let's read God's answer to Moses' question. And he said, please show me your glory. Then God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Exodus 33, 18 and 19. God's glory then is his character. That's from our teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for page 172. In the end, God will be calling his people to come out of every law-breaking church. Is that going to be the major issue? Is it whether or not they're keeping all of the commandments? Or is there something more? Does this remind you of anything? This is exactly what happened in the days of Noah. And what did Jesus say? As it was in the days of Noah, Noah so also shall it be at the coming of, coming the, son of the Son of Man. No, God sent a message to the antediluvian world. When it was clear that maybe I, some out there don't know the word, word antediluvian, what's antediluvian mean? Before, Before the flood. The Before the flood. When it was clear that each person had made up his mind about where they were going to stand on the issues, Noah and his family got in the boat. Then the flood came. Spiritual Babylon in our day will do the same thing. Demonic forces are building and will eventually take control of modern spiritual Babylon. Babylon's wine represents false teachings and false doctrines. Jim, I think that next one is yours. Demonic forces will eventually take total control of modern spiritual Babylon. She becomes a dwelling place for demons, excuse me, of demons, a prison for every foul spirit. God's people are filled with the Holy Spirit and by contrast, the spirit of demons filled Babylon. When any individual or religious organization knowingly turns from the teachings of the scripture, they become open to spiritual delusions. The only way to avoid being controlled by unholy spirits is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit in the Bible study guide. Okay. Revelation 18, verse 3, tells us that all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we have heard some very awakening messages here in this study, things that should wake us up and and get us to open our Bibles and read carefully the book of Revelation and then all of Scripture. Help us to recognize the signs which are unfolding around us. Surely there must be many of them, and these signs should cause us to go forth with renewed energy to spread the truth about you to everyone who will listen. May that be our experience this week as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.